Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Turner House. This is the headquarters of the American Society of International Law. My name is Wes Rist. I'm the Deputy Executive Director here at ASIL. Uh, very briefly, if you're not familiar with the Society, we are a 113-year-old professional membership association for international lawyers. We were founded by the Secretary of State for Teddy Roosevelt in 1906, who looked around and said, we need somebody who knows something about this international law stuff. And pretty much ever since then, we've been serving an informational and educational role about international law and including a wide variety of topics. We don't drill down on any particular one area. Um, we have a broad focus and our members kind of generate our interest. We are also, it's worth mentioning, nonpartisan and non-advocacy. So we don't take particular stances on issues. We encourage debate, discussion, and education around those particular topics. I'm very thrilled tonight that we're going to have the discussion sponsored by our government attorney's interest group on uh, international law and space debris. Um, and partly because, as most of the folks in the space law interest group also know, this is a field that I geek out about quite uh, extensively and enjoy quite a lot. Um, but also because this is actually falling under a new initiative of the society called our Signature Topics Initiative. And we have two of them. Uh, this year that will be continuing through the next year. The first is on atrocity prevention uh, through international law, and we've actually had a series of public events around that. The other is about areas beyond national jurisdiction, and it focuses on things like the polar regions, the Arctic, uh, cyberspace, and outer space. And so this is one of those events that our government attorney's interest group decided to organize in conjunction uh, with our speakers today around that particular signature topic initiative. So we're very pleased about that. If you're interested in events like this and more events that are on broader discussions, our annual meeting is coming up in just 63 days, not that I'm counting. Um, it is a four-day conference here in DC. Over 1,300 international lawyers from about 60 different countries come. Uh, there will be 50 different substantive sessions going on, including a few on international law and technology and explicitly one on space law issues as well. Um, so you're welcome to check that out on our website. Uh, I'm not going to hold anything up anymore beyond that. I'm going to turn it instead to Sean. Um, Sean is the vice chair, events chair of the, the Government Attorney's Interest Group, and he's going to introduce our speakers. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Government Attorney's Interest Group uh, and the other co-sponsors of this event, I want to thank you for joining us this evening for, uh, for what I'm sure will be a fascinating uh, and informative discussion. Our panel this evening is entitled Space Junk and International Law, Legal Issues Surrounding Space Debris. Uh, as the title suggests, we'll be discussing a wide range of issues, uh, including what space junk or space degree is exactly, uh, who and what creates it, uh, what problems arise from having all of this man-made debris uh, in Earth's orbit, uh, and what legal regime governs these issues. Uh, and guiding our discussion are two uh, distinguished experts on the topic of space debris and space law more generally. Uh, on my right next to the monitor is Steve Mermina. Professor Mermina is currently an adjunct professor of space law at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, since 1999, he has also worked as an attorney in the International Law Practice Group of the NASA Office of the General Counsel, and he has spoken and written extensively on space law issues, uh, including in the American Journal of International Law. And on my immediate right, we are fortunate to have with us uh, Jessica Noble, uh, Ms. Noble works as in-house counsel for NanoRacks, a company that provides goods and services for commercial enterprises um, operating in low Earth orbit. Uh, Ms. Noble previously worked on Capitol Hill advising on space policy, uh, and she has also worked as a consultant on international telecommunications policy for various private companies, uh, and also as a prosecutor in Southern New Mexico. <laughs> so the format of our discussion will be as follows. Um, our two presenters will engage in an interactive discussion uh, on our evening's topic. Um, and at about 7.10, so about an hour from now, uh, Steve and Jessica will take questions from the audience. Uh, and that will go for about 20 minutes. Um, following that, we invite all of you to join us for reception uh, in this room, this area. We'll open the doors uh, where we can continue our discussion um, all of us furloughees can commiserate with each other. Uh, and of course, we can uh, enjoy some refreshments. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to our speakers. Thank you. Oh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, we greatly appreciate you braving the cold uh, since uh, that temperature is quickly dropping out there. And we also just want to extend a thank you to our host at ASIL, um, Wes, Sean, Josh, you all have been fantastic in helping to put this event together. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'll start off with a little bit about myself. As Sean said, I work as in-house counsel with NanoRex. We provide uh, services to the International Space Station. We provide platforms for science experiments and also deployment of CubeSats, both on station and through various launch vehicles. Um, previously, I had worked for, some, uh, for a consultant on international uh, telecommunications issues, and one of those, uh, those, those issues that arises is uh, how you comply with uh, aspects of orbital debris mitigation. So know a little bit about the subject volume, just a very little bit, um, and turn it over to my colleague and good friend, Steve Mermina. Thank you, Jess. Um, thank you all for coming. And again, a big thanks to Wes from the American Society of International Law and to Josh Carland and uh, Sean Elliott from the Government Attorneys Interest Group. And uh, as was stated earlier, I am a government attorney in the interest group working at NASA during the day. And uh, one thing I wanna point out in terms of the cover slide and the rest of the presentation is the views here are personal to me, don't reflect the views of NASA or the US government in any way. Um, and in terms of the other government attorneys, like Sean said, we're looking forward to talking about being furloughed and uh, all the joy that that brings as government attorneys. <laughs> So just a little bit about me, I, um, just like I said, I, I've been at NASA just shy of 20 years now doing international law, and I've written about space debris, and I teach space debris over at Georgetown Law School. That's fine for now. Okay. And just to add to uh, the disclaimer for this evening, all of the views expressed are those of myself and not my employer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as we want to kick off the discussion here, Steve. So this is gonna be a little bit more of an interactive experience. We want this to, to be a true discussion about the issues we're gonna be talking about. So feel free to, to jump in as well. But Steve, I was hoping if you could tell us a little bit more about what is space debris exactly? Sure, thanks. So space debris, there, there, there was no space debris problem before um, there were things launched into space. Um, it, it seems kind of a, an odd thing to say, but um, it's a problem that's only developed in the last six decades or so. So it's relatively new under international law. It's not something we've been grappling with. There's not a lot of customary international law or practice that goes back like you might see in the law of the sea or something that goes back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I tend to do when I lecture is I really like to get involvement from the audience. So. Um, there are small little quizzes that I have, so I want to make sure people are paying attention. Ever and, the law school professor here. <laughs> and um, but the but one thing I do that other law school professors don't is I have little gifts and, and little prizes for you if you if you answer the question. So um, can anybody say what was the first satellite launched into space? Does anybody know? So I heard. Do you have enough for the whole here. class? I, I I might actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do we know what year it was launched? <laughs> well, the reason that's yeah, the, the reason that's relevant is because um, before 1957, there was no space debris issue, but over the last 50 years, things have happened in space and it wasn't necessarily accidental and it wasn't necessarily something that wasn't expected, but things have gotten lost in space. Um, there was an astronaut who lost his glove in space. It was Ed White, uh, it was during, uh, in fact, the first spacewalk. 
he lost the glove. Um, astronauts have discarded garbage out of their out of their spacecraft. And in fact, there was an astronaut um, some years ago who was doing a spacewalk and she had a toolbox and she didn't tether it properly. And when she was in outer space, the toolbox floated away from her. And um, you can actually go to YouTube and you can find a video of her during her spacewalk. And unfortunately you can see the toolbox floating away and her trying to go after it to, <laughs> to grab it. And, uh, and, and the toolbox was in space for about two weeks or so before it came back and then burned up in the atmosphere. And all of these things do become space debris. Um, but space debris is anything that's no longer useful. It could be parts of old rockets, uh, satellites that, that don't function anymore, or all the, the smaller parts of satellites, which are designed in such a way that space debris was expected as part of the normal creation of the spacecraft. So for example, if there's a camera that has essentially a lens cap and the lens cap comes off, that lens cap could become space debris. Um, but also there are fuel tanks, uh, there are batteries, and later on when we talk about remediation measures, you don't want to have a satellite that has electricity built up inside of it with a full fuel tank, because you can just imagine that that's going to lead to a debris creating situation later on. So sometimes I'll call it space debris, other times it's called space junk. I'll just use those terms synonymously. Um, however, more than anything else, what's created the most space debris have, has been countries that have intentionally created debris. The United States has done it most recently and most famously the Chinese ASAT test when China destroyed its own aging weather satellite, the Fengyun 1C, I think that was 2007. And uh, that created 3000 trackable pieces of debris. Uh, and there are many more pieces of debris that were not trackable. And by trackable, and we'll talk about that after as well. Uh, it means whether or not we can see it from the earth with our, our optical telescopes. For something to be seen from the earth, it has to be about the size of a, a softball or so. Um, otherwise, it's too small to be seen from the earth. Okay, so now a quick show of hands. This is just um, to make sure people are still awake. Um, true or false, every day on average, a piece of space debris falls back to earth. Let's see the hands for a true. How many people think true and how many people think false? Okay, well, the trues have it. The trues have it. On average, more or less, every day, something falls back to Earth. And when it does, most of the time, it burns up. So in the top right corner of the screen, you can see a picture of the Russian space station as it came back and re-entered in the atmosphere. Um, the other two pictures show those instances where the space debris didn't burn up. Um, and one shows a rocket motor that landed in Saudi Arabia, and then the other one was part of a fuel tank that landed in Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry, that landed in, in Africa. And the reason these things survived re-entry is because they're designed to withstand high pressures and high temperatures, so they didn't burn up in the atmosphere when they were returned. Another thing to keep in mind is the Earth's surface is about 71% ocean. So even if it does survive re-entry, which is not likely, most of the time it would splash into the ocean if it did re-enter. And if it did hit land, well, most of the land is unoccupied. Something like 80% of the land on Earth is unoccupied. There's tundra and there's desert and there's forests. And um, probably it's not going to hit a, a major city. Just statistically, it wouldn't happen. But we do have an entertaining little video to show you what, what could happen if it were to, um, to, to land in a city. Let's see, that's not it. That's coming though. All right, so this is it. Can you guys hear it okay? Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, Steve, so who's liable? <laughs> the launching state. <laughs> that, that's on the next slide. That's oh, coming up. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to the legal issues. Um, this is a NASA image generated by NASA's Orbital Debris Program Office down at the Johnson Space Center. And I want to take a minute to explain what it is. Um, if you look in the center, you can see the, the Earth. And uh, it's hard to see it because it's essentially covered by essentially a blanket. Uh, and that's space debris that's in low Earth orbit. Uh, that debris could be up there a period of weeks or months or years. It depends on the altitude. Um, the outer ring, the largest ring you see on the screen, is debris that's in geostationary orbit. That's about 36,000 kilometers up. That debris is not going anywhere unless it's physically removed from orbit. That's going to be there forever. Um, and the various pieces of debris that you see in the middle are in eccentric orbits or uh, medium or mid orbits. And that could be up there 800 years, it could be up there 1,000 years. Um, but it's, it's a problem that if things were to get substantially worse, it could seriously impact uh, operations. We're going to talk about that as well in greater detail afterwards. Okay, now we have another quiz coming up. Um, and you might have heard of this, you might have seen it. It was even in the movie Gravity, so um, you, you might know this. But the amount of space junk that's in space continues to grow. Uh, when two pieces of space junk are in, outer, are in outer space and they collide, they make more space junk. The space junk, of course, hits other space junk and it's a cascading effect. And um, it creates still more space junk and then it continues to essentially have a domino effect. And not Teresa, but does anyone else <laughs> know what this is called? Please in the back. Kessler syndrome. Can you describe it? five more fragments, they all get other things, and there's a tipping point where everything just shreds everything and space becomes unusable for a thousand years. Very good, very good. Here, here. a little mission patch, so thank you. Um, well, yes, exactly, is what you said, is, is correct. Um, in 2006, there was an article in, in Nature magazine, which I think is really profound, and what it said was that even if we stopped launching anything else and never did anything more for the next 200 years the space debris problem is going to continue to get worse mm -hmm. and that's because the debris that's up in space is going to hit <coughs> the other debris that's up in space and create more debris and over time about 200 years from now the debris that's up there will eventually start to burn up in the atmosphere and will start to clean itself out but that's assuming we launch nothing further and that's not going to happen. We're going to continue to launch more satellites in space. So it is a problem that's going to continue to worsen. 
Here, um, I think this series of images is really telling. So in the top left corner, you can see 1960, and that's just the Earth. And if you look really closely, you may or may not see a, a piece of uh, debris or a satellite up there. But you can see in 1965, in 1970, there was a proliferation of low Earth orbit satellites, and that's why you could see the kind of blanket covering the Earth. And then in 1975, 1980, 1985, you can see when we are able to get to geostationary orbit and, and use the other orbits between LEO and GEO. And then January 2009 was the most recent image I could find, but you could see just how the debris problem has accelerated mm -hmm. over time. So, Steve, <laughs> you've talked a little bit about this, uh, about the amount of debris that that has accelerated, but space is big. Mm. Space is extremely huge. It's mind boggling mm. how huge it is. Mm -hmm. Why is this a problem? Um, yes, space is, is, is infinite. We can't even really wrap our heads around how big space is. But I think one of the key issues is um, there are certain orbits that we use and the rest of the space, we, we don't know how to use just yet. Mm. Um, so there was a time, and this I think is also just in a future slide, where we thought we can just dump things in the ocean because the oceans are so big, we could not possibly pollute the entire ocean, right? Mm -hmm. And we've learned that we're very good at, at polluting. Um, but so many things we do depend on space. We do weather forecasting, uh, depends on space, agriculture, GPS, if you go to McDonald's and you buy a hamburger and you swipe your credit card, that's going to go to your bank via satellites. Um, if you want to watch the, the Super Bowl and you're going to use direct TV and you're going to watch TV from satellite or um, formerly voices would go off of satellites to make international calls. So there are so many things that depend on, on outer space that, of course, if we have uh, space junk, it's going to really impact uh, our lives in any way. And here you can see the the uh, comment that I just made, mm -hmm. space is so big, how can we possibly pollute it? Well, we use certain orbits. We use LEO and GEO and eccentric orbits, but the rest of the space we, we don't really use. Um, so the places that we do use are the places that are, of course, the most, most polluted. And space junk could cause serious damage. So on the, on the left corner of the screen, you can see that is an actual space shuttle cockpit window that was pierced by a fleck of paint. Um, because the fleck of paint is traveling at um, 18,000 miles an hour, it has such um, velocity and uh, force when it hits that it would shatter the, the windshield. And um, as it says there, in the first 75 shuttle flights, NASA had to replace 60 windows. Of course, each window cost $40,000 each. It's not just like a car windshield, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, in the bottom center, you can see a picture of a hole that was made in a solar panel. And they don't even know what caused that hole. They checked it, they studied it. And um, the fact that if somebody were to lose even like just a little tiny screw, or again, if a fleck of paint could pierce a windshield, then something more substantial could destroy a, a spaceship or certainly could pierce through a, an astronaut's EVA suit, mm -hmm. hoses, or vulnerable parts of the space station. Um, Here's a question for the audience. Does anybody know what space shuttle that is on the left? There's only one correct answer to this. Why, why do you think that? Because the solid booster tank Uh-huh. That's right. Do you want to explain why? You're right. You're 100% right. I don't know if it had to do with cost, but maybe the Yeah. The external tank uh, in, in, in future space shuttles was, was orange. It was the color of the foam that was sprayed on it. This one was painted white. It was the very first space shuttle flight. It was Columbia. It was STS-1. And NASA realized that they could save 700 pounds of paint, of mass, by not painting the external tank. So there's no reason to carry it up to orbit and then just drop it back down in the ocean. So um, very good job. So here, got a prize for you as well. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. There may be prizes for other people. So don't feel sad. Um, and this is kind of a cute little um, statistic. And um, if you were here a little bit early tonight at 5.58 PM, right outside of this window over here, the space shuttle flew over. 
The was, International Space Shuttle. I'm sorry, Space Shuttle. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> the Space Shuttle flew over. I'm that looking at a picture of the Space Shuttle, yeah. right. The International <laughs> Space Station flew over. And um, it was visible for five minutes, which is a really long time for it to be visible. And it was almost about 90 degrees. I think it was 81 degrees overhead. And there's an app you can get for your phone where you could type in your zip code and you'll get notifications of when it's visible. But when it flies overhead, it's visible either just before sunrise or just after sunset because um, while the sun is below the horizon, it would light up the space station. It's got no lights on it, but if you ever see it, you'll know it. It's it's as bright as a really, like, almost like an airplane light, but it doesn't blink. Um, but it's certainly brighter than the brightest star. So you can go out and see the International Space Station as it flies overhead. It's kind of cool. Legal issues. All right, now we're getting into the meat of this. So we've talked about the about space debris and the proliferation of it and why this is a problem as far as our assets in orbit and safety issues. So, so what is the international legal regime that, that covers this um, or attempts to, to address these problems? Thanks. Um, well, space debris and the creation of space debris is not against the law. It's not against international law. It's not against domestic law. And in fact, it's it's almost expected that if you're going to operate in space, you're going to have some debris creating issues. Mm -hmm. um, the law on space. So can I just see a quick show of hands? Is anybody interested in becoming a space lawyer? Wow, good. Look at that. So I recommend that you think about <laughs> going into space law. It's not too late to change careers. Um, and the reason is all the space law you ever need is in this book right here. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, only, there are only five treaties that you need to know. And some would say that they're really only four. But there are five United Nations mm -hmm. treaties on space. Um, so if you want to learn space law, and, and space law didn't really exist until 1967 with the first treaty, the Outer Space Treaty mm -hmm. of 1967. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, is is that true, or would you consider the overflight of Sputnik the the first creation of of space law? Well, I, that that's that's a fair question. So certainly, the overflight, I would say, itself didn't create space law, but maybe the lack of objections of any mm -hmm. states, um, arguably, could have created a, a custom that flying over without uh, advance permission from the overflown Wasn't states. That, um, Eisenhower's intent was sort of open. That's right. Mm -hmm. The International Geophysical Year, and right, exactly. You're also neglecting the ITU. They might have a little bit of transparency. That's right. <laughs> so for for and folks that I was say, for folks that didn't hear the comment, we talked about the ITU, which has been in effect since the late 1800s, <laughs> and uh, the International Telecommunications Union. That publishes what they call radio regulations, but um, I mean, even in the U.S., we consider these the Constitution and Convention as treaty-level documents. Yep. Point well taken. Um, well, the Outer Space Treaty, um, some people call it like the Magna Carta of outer space, is is the fundamental kind of the bedrock document for outer space law, and it's got a couple provisions which are potentially applicable to um, space debris. So, Article One guarantees states. It says outer space shall be free for exploration and use by all states. So some might say if there's a creation of space debris and the space debris gets so bad that mm -hmm. countries are prevented from operating in outer space, then could it be a violation of this provision that outer space shall be free for use by all states? Article 3 says that space exploration shall be conducted in accordance with international law. So that's not only the Outer Space Treaty itself, but all international law. So it has to be conducted in accordance with international environmental law to the extent it's ever applicable if the law of a sea were to be applicable or international humanitarian law. But all bodies of law um, have to be uh, complied with, even the UN Charter. Um, article 6 is a particular article that says that uh, national states have to authorize and continually supervise the activities of their nationals. So you might have seen uh, in the press some statements, uh, some, I would say, inaccurate statements by private entities that say, I don't have to comply with the treaties because I never signed them 
and treaties are only applicable to states, and I'm not a state, therefore I don't have to comply with international law. Um, that's not a view to which I ascribe, and I think that, um, that, that many legal scholars would disagree with that view. Um, here in the case of the Outer Space Treaty, it says that states, of course, have to follow the treaties, but the states also need to make sure that their nationals follow the treaties as well. And the way the states do that is through their own national legislation. So the Article VI um, responsibility that's, that states are responsible for their nationals, the way they do that is through domestic legislation. One interesting part of the Outer Space Treaty, which is also applicable to space debris, is Article VIII. Uh, Article VIII essentially says that a state that launches an object retains ownership for that object. So if there's an object, mm -hmm. and, and because an object includes its component parts, that's another mm -hmm. provision, um, it states that uh, the, the way the logic goes is that uh, a state is responsible for satellites that it launches, but also if the satellite were to break up, then the debris from that satellite would be owned or by that the state, the launching state would be responsible for it, essentially. So you can't give up ownership by launching. You can't say, you know what, I'm done with it. You know, I'm, it's, I'm abandoning it in space. Mm -hmm. And then we can get later on into a discussion of, of salvage law and whether or not like in maritime law, if you could go and retrieve somebody else's space debris and get some kind of a reward for it. And I think that that, that would be an interesting topic to delve into. Um, I know there's a, a slide that deals with this later on talking about the, uh, the efforts at uh, space debris mitigation mm -hmm. That are coming into that are coming into fruition these days, but there uh, there's a possibility. Um, companies are working on um, on either space tugs or um, on satellites uh, that can go and service other satellites. So I think that this this idea of ownership never never ceasing could come into play as we're seeing more technological advances to come mm -hmm. and address the, you know, what we would consider debris that's in orbit right now, defunct satellites that could be used again. Please, Can I Teresa? ask a question about mm -hmm. um, sure. salvage law? I don't know anything about maritime salvage law, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, does that essentially say, like, if something's abandoned and nobody knows who it belongs to, they can just go get it? Is that what it does? So is oh, there anybody yes. in the audience who's well versed in maritime law? Because I'd just be interested if there's yeah. what the parallel, you know, like at what point is something considered abandoned in the ocean? Yeah. I mean, obviously if it has a flag on it, I'm not sure it would be considered abandoned. We've been, we've been kicking around this idea about mm -hmm. what to do about how harmful contamination versus ownership never ceases. Mm -hmm. If you if it's untrackable, then you don't know whose it is. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know if it's man-made could be natural, could be micrometeorites or something like that. So mm -hmm. there are, they are there. So one might say, you could go to the ITU, you could say, I'm going to um, <clears throat> coordinate a particular orbit, and anybody that's got debris in that orbit come forward and coordinate with us, or well, will, mm -hmm. to then are then to go up and, and rid yourself of the harmful contamination that's going to prohibit you from freely exploring and using that particular orbit. Mm -hmm. That's something we've been kind of kicking around, and nobody's ever that's a reason why that wouldn't necessarily work. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, just to answer Teresa's question, so I, I'm not an expert in maritime law, but I know that there was a really good article written by Matt Schaefer a few years ago about the intersection of uh, salvage law and uh, active debris removal. Okay. Uh, and I can really send that yeah, to you if you can't find it right away. Article 9 is um, in the Outer Space Treaty says that there's a duty to avoid harmful contamination. When exploring outer space. And this article can be read in, in different ways. Um, the most common reading is to refer to you can't contaminate um, a planet that you're going to go explore. You can't bring contamination with you. If you want to go explore Mars, you don't want to bring microbes of dust with you and then say that you've discovered something when it was really just something that you transported with you. That's forward contamination and back contamination is if you bring samples back from another planet or an asteroid, you don't want to contaminate the Earth. But another way to read the article is that there's just a duty to avoid harmful contamination in the exploration of outer space. And what's to me the most interesting part of this article is it doesn't say that there's a duty to avoid contamination. 
it's only a duty to avoid harmful contamination. Mm -hmm. So to me, that means some contamination is expected. Well, and I guess uh, the question then that I would have is what is, how do we define harmful? What is, what is the scale? Because I think that we can, you know, we can find something on either end of the, the spectrum, but mm -hmm. where's that, where's the, the line where right. something crosses over from benign to harmful? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. And um, just two reactions. One is mm -hmm. whatever harmful is, apparently we haven't seen it yet because, um, I mean, a couple of things come to mind. Um, airburst, airburst and above airburst, which gave rise to this treaty altogether was to avoid harmful mm -hmm. contamination. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, nuclear yeah. radiation that then get in milk. Okay. Yeah. It's scared. Um, well, the reason I said we haven't seen it yet is because um, in 2007 with the Chinese ASAT test, I'm not aware of any state that um, raised Article 9 in uh, diplomatic communiques with, with China to say that mm -hmm. nobody asserted that Article 9 was violated. So if, if, if Chinese, that's not... The Japanese mm -hmm. do something. They, they, they invoked the outer space treaty, but I don't remember what article. Um, it, might have been, it might have been article... Might have been the one that's about um, consulting. You know, Article Ten. Isn't that Article Ten where you consult? You have to consult if you're going to do something. That with with due regard, mm -hmm. that's an earlier part of, of Article yes. Nine. Um, but uh, no, no state I'm aware of has raised Article Nine. Nobody right. has said that it's been I, violated. I look what the Japanese did. Mm -hmm. By the way, while you're on the yeah, on the treaty, yeah, is, please. Is there a judicatory provision for the Outer Space Treaty or dispute resolution provision? I suppose mm -hmm. the Japanese did assert this was a contravention. Well, certainly a case could be brought before the ICJ if the, case, if, the if the states were to agree to jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But there's also another convention that I was just about to refer to, the 1972 Liability Convention, mm -hmm. that has uh, procedures built in there for a claims commission to be established where one state caused damage to another state. What's interesting about the liability convention is it says that if damage is ever caused on the ground to the surface of the earth, that the launching state is absolutely liable for such damage. Absolutely liable. But if damage is done in outer space, then they're only liable if they're at fault. So it's going to be really hard to prove fault. Um, it's particularly hard if you have space debris and you don't know the origin of it. A, a lot of the debris is trackable, and then we could trace it back to the spacecraft from which it came, and we could find out what is the right launching state. But for anything that we can't track, we don't know what the cause of the debris would be. And then the second concern with that is if you have a, an active satellite and you have, a, a, a let's say, a dead satellite or a piece of space junk coming at it, the best we can do is a, is a conjunction analysis where we say in three days, two days, one day, the, the space debris may hit the, the, the active satellite, right? It may come within 50 kilometer box around it. So then the, the recipient of that information, the person with the active satellite, they can try to get out of the way of the oncoming debris, but they may in fact move into the path of the debris. So then if you have to prove fault, it's really hard to say, well, who's at fault? Is it the active satellite that moved into the path or is it the, the, the dead satellite? And there hasn't been a case on this yet, um, but it's certainly something that we, we like to talk about in space law class. Has there been, uh, has there been any uh, invocation of the, of the liability convention at all, whether in space or, or on earth? Yeah, the, the one time that it was invoked was um, the uh, Soviet Union had launched a nuclear-powered mm -hmm. satellite. It was called Cosmos 954, mm -hmm. and it crashed into the Canadian tundra. And Canada presented a claim to the Soviets for $12 million for cleanup costs. Mm -hmm. And uh, although it was presented under the liability convention, mm -hmm. um, the Soviet Union later made a, an ex gratia payment of, of $6 million, essentially denying any responsibility and fault for it, but nevertheless contributing to the, the cleanup cost. And that was the only kind of court case under the liability commission, or the only claims commission case. And it never even got to a commission. Okay. So we haven't had any anything on the books yet to to establish mm -hmm. uh, 
the law for the liability convention other than the treaty itself. Right. Sorry, Please. That, um, states are trying to reserve the right to uh, have to create uh, space debris. I mean, it seems to me at some point the spacefaring nation might want to establish some type of like, uh, like freedom of navigation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you might also do the same thing in space and say, well, no, we're going to object. But the reason they're not doing it is they want to reserve the right for themselves. And, and also, the second question is, do you think that it's only states that are spacefaring that have the necessary interest to make a claim, or could other states who may be concerned about the future mm -hmm. have that, think about that as themselves going to say, well, I think this is a right for humanity and the environment here to have. Right. I'm sure there are actually ways of other things to do, but I mean, this is yeah. hard. So, so again, just my, my personal opinion is I, I think that there probably were reasons that states didn't raise um, Article 9 in relation to the 2007 Chinese ASET test. And um, I mean, one of them very well could be that they could see themselves one day wanting to conduct an ASET maneuver, and therefore it's hard to complain against something that they're going to do. And it wasn't very long after that that the U.S. conducted a... A, a, a similar, in some respects, maneuver in space where we shot down a satellite that was not controllable, that had hydrazine on it, and it was going to impact um, the Earth's surface about two weeks later. So the U.S. shot it down, um, but they did it in a very different way. Um, when the U.S. took down its own satellite that was filled with hydrazine, it was very dangerous to the folks on the surface of the Earth. They did it in a way that all the debris burned up I think 99% of the debris burned up within two weeks after. It was a very low altitude, whereas the Chinese ASAT test, um, the weather satellite was, I don't remember exactly, 700 to 800 kilometers off the surface of the Earth. And it was shot in such a way that, if I understand correctly, it pushed the debris up higher into higher orbits so that it was literally going to be there for hundreds or thousands of years. And it's going to continue to rain down on all the spacecraft that were beneath the point of impact. Um, so it, it's it's not really even easy to say in the same breath that the US test and the Chinese test were, were similar. It's just that just in time, one was I think some weeks or months after the other. Were you gonna say? No, I was, I was just going to agree that, well, of course other countries didn't want to raise raise claims because they still want to, able to maintain that ability to conduct those tests themselves or to use it as as a bargaining chip mm -hmm. uh, for further discussions or or negotiations mm -hmm. i think that it was in their it was in their interest for other spacefaring nations to stay quiet at the time mm -hmm. and I, I think your second point is really interesting and this has to do with states that are not yet spacefaring Mm -hmm. and whether or not they would have any kind of standing to bring a claim for pollution of the commons, essentially, or for saying that, you know, we might not be able to become spacefaring because of these, these space debris creating events right now. And um, there are a lot of notions of, of equity in that, and um, even sort of intergenerational equity do people have a right to a clean environment? Is there an obligation to keep space free for future generations? And um, I have certain views on that, but let me just turn it over to the audience because I think this is something as international lawyers that we could all talk about. Uh, go ahead, please. Since I picked it up, I, yeah. I think the wiring of it is practical. There's, there's a global commons kind of issue. There's also the practical issue that you pointed out that uh, modern life depends on space. Mm -hmm. And that, frankly speaking, uh, there are orbits as you, as you mentioned, there's certain orbits that are more valuable than others. Mm -hmm. and, and those orbits are needed. I mean, you can just imagine, if you watch television, the preoccupation with dystopias is incredible. You know, so the kind of world that we live in, if we didn't have the things that we have. Mm -hmm. And so to me, in my mind, it's like, even if you were a country that doesn't necessarily have your own satellites, you have a great, you have a, a direct practical interest on, say, uh, for example, the, um, um, the the GPS system. I mean, clearly sure. that's mm -hmm. 
Yep. It's everybody's got it. All of us. Mm -hmm. And the communication satellites and things like that. Those things are, are, are something that every nation has a need for. So, and there are many other reasons. So I'm wondering if at some point it might be a, a useful thing for the states to think about making that point. I always thought of the U.S. example that you brought. Mm -hmm. The U.S. was sort of, that's the good example. That's how to do it. Right. So the Chinese is now not to do it. And sort of in a sense, although there are a lot of people that see many motivations how the U.S. is doing, it does have that advantage of saying, well, if you're going to do an ASAP, do it this way, mm -hmm. not, not mm -hmm. way it very much. So I, that's my thought, and I don't want to hear other people's sure. thoughts on it as well. I don't know if the same principles apply in um, in the Wild Sea and yeah. you know those people who are not they're not they're landlocked states still have a right right to invoke the Wild Sea. I, I think there's an analogy with the geostationary park in the 80s and 90s. There was a mm -hmm. widespread movement in developing countries to reserve slots in the orbital arc through the ITU. For countries that will someday in the future have the ability to deploy satellites in the world. And it was a great struggle actually with the overwhelming majority of developing countries taking the position that orbital slots should be reserved and held vacant for future use for countries that will be. So I think the concept is already established in many developing countries. I think what yep. led to the, the standing up of the long term sustainable use of space working group in Copia was from 2007. We just concluded last year in June mm -hmm. and with the 21 guidelines and best practices, voluntary guidelines and best practices that came out of that, that, that work uh, way back here mm -hmm. uh, for China's mm -hmm. uh, secure world. But um, I think that so you saw a lot of interest right. uh, by folks, by members of Copia, that were, you wouldn't necessarily call them. Major space variations, but they had uh, they had experts that could come and talk about sustainability and sure. those sorts of things. That was part of that discussion. Even the rights of development generally. Yeah, they they yeah. were especially keen on the, uh, the some of the text that were that was the overarching text to the, to the various things. So our our friends in the group of Latin American Caribbean countries, mm -hmm. Lock, yep. they had uh, a lot of they stood firm on getting their text um, massage with. Output of others, the US specifically, to get something they could live with, and having mm -hmm. to do with that whole that idea. But it sort of maintains kind That's of an right. equitable access mm -hmm. kind, of, sure. kind of thing, but without the formalities of. of there there are world. actually a number of UN resolutions that deal with um, space and access to <coughs> space and the developing countries' rights. These are resolutions um, which are not law. The resolutions mm -hmm. are not law. Mm -hmm. um, they're softball, right? You call them softball or yes. something. They're, like they're not finding their yeah. softball um, yeah. at best and political. So there are uh, resolutions to that accord, but um, but I don't I don't think there's any hard law. Mm -hmm. So let me just take the floor for a second. The folks standing in the back, there are two seats up here in front. If you guys want to come back, and I don't know if there's anybody else out the door who wants to come in, but there are two empty seats up here. If you guys would like to, you're welcome to. So Chris, um, Mark had brought up the long-term sustainability guidelines, and Chris Johnson co-teaches the class uh, at Georgetown on space law, and Chris was involved in a lot of those discussions. So Chris, do you want to just address that a little bit? You were an expert, though. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, oh, so uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Chris uh, from Secure World. Um, yeah, so you mentioned these LTS guidelines, long-term sustainability guidelines, done within Pilpuis. Um I think they're significant because they are 87 member states who worked on these uh, like finalization of best practices. So this is, a, a, I view it kind of as a success because it is, you know, when we compare it to other activities at the UN level or the international level, they actually, you know, got to some type of conclusion on existing best practices. So what states currently do that are, everyone says, well, these are best practices for long-term sustainability. Um, for existing activities, so not for activities five years from now, like satellite servicing. Um, and so, yeah, a number of them have provisions that look to uh, not international law, but national activities mm -hmm. in the regulation of space debris. So they would look to uh, particular countries like, say, for example, France or the U.S. that has binding national municipal law on space debris mm -hmm. and says, well, that's a best practice. We would like to see that promulgated elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, 
anything you'd like to add to that, Mark? You were in the expert group, right? You were in expert, was it B, which was on um, the, the more technical side. Um, I think the other thing I've, I wanted to point out, you, you brought up this idea, slightly changing gears, of intergenerational equity. Mm -hmm. And can you explain what that is for folks who may not know? Um, so the de you know the definition of sustainable development is taking into account the needs of the present generation and the needs of succeeding generations and somehow balancing them. Mm -hmm. um, it's at the at the UN level, something new has been created in the last. I think I, I don't know the details of it over the last decade, but there is an ombudsman for children. So they know that the, the people who can work at the UN level are adults who are trained, but who speaks for future generations? They realized that that was a problem, that future generations were not represented. And they created an ombudsman uh, who speaks for, on behalf of future generations. I, this is interesting because it's not, you know, usually at the UN level, it's states representing their interests in what you, you could say it's not all stakeholders in humanity, it's only the rights of states. So they created this ombudsman for children. Uh, I, you know, I'm speaking, regardless of its political practicality or whether this could happen, but I think it'd be amazing if there could be also ombudsmans for not just states, but for commonly shared spaces. Who speaks on behalf of the space domain and protecting the space domain? Who speaks on behalf of um, future generations that would like to use that space domain? I think that there's something to be developed possibly in a better world where long-term interests are more respected, something could develop for that uh, ombudsman for space. Very good. That's what I would say. So you remember in Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty, it says that the exploration of space has to be done in accordance with international law. Mm -hmm. So another body of law besides space law, of course, is international environmental law. And um, Folks always cite the trail smelter arbitration, and that was kind of the, the fundamental first example where it was stated that a, a state does not have the right to cause pollution outside of its national jurisdiction or outside of its borders. And that was repeated in you know 1972 and then again in 1992 uh, where uh, in the Rio Declaration where it's, I, I think this has crystallized as a principle of, of customary international law that states have the responsibility to avoid causing damage beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. And that's where Wes kicked us off talking about that. That's mm -hmm. the signature topic for this year for areas beyond national jurisdiction. That's why we have space in the oceans and cyberspace. Mm -hmm. um, I put down just for, for discussion purposes, the London Convention on Ocean Dumping, because that's something that's uh, that comes up every now and then. And it says that there's uh, an obligation to uh, <coughs> avoid and intentionally putting pollution into the ocean. And here the, the words are, are very important. They're very nuanced. Um, but when um, entities launch into outer space and the launch vehicles um, and the stages of the rocket splash down into the ocean, some might say, aren't you intentionally causing ocean pollution? Um, and that's a, a question that does come up from time to time and it's looked at and people have different perspectives on that. And then the last uh, bullet I have is um, what had been the draft articles on state responsibility, which I learned recently have become no longer draft, but they're the articles on state responsibility. And uh, they state clearly that states have the obligation to be responsible for any damage that they cause outside of their national jurisdiction or outside of their borders. What's the ILC Internet. Oh, sorry, that's the International Law Commission, oh, the ILC, International, Commission. International Law Commission. Yeah. So I was just interested in that, uh, and and what you were talking about with the the London Convention and the, I uh, and the first stages of the of the rockets that that were dropped into the sea. Do you think that this is going to be something that comes up for, you know? Uh, you know, in greater discussion now that we do have some companies that are using reusable first stages, that mm -hmm. the technology is there. Mm -hmm. And is there now going to be a, a responsibility on on launch companies, well, on states and then uh, passed down to their private entities to be using reusable first stages to come into compliance with treaty obligations? Mm -hmm. 
Or is that just pie in the sky thinking on my part? No, I, I, Law school hypothetical. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think as as a technology develops, I mean, that mm-hmm. could become in time a best mm-hmm. practice to why why throw away mm-hmm. a first stage and why risk polluting the ocean environment when if maybe I'm sure it's going to be at more expense or greater expense that they can bring the launch vehicle or the first stage back and reuse it. So it's been stated by some launching states that um, it's not really ocean dumping, that um, the the first stages create artificial reefs and that fish will populate the reefs and um, they become healthy environments for fish in the ocean. Um, and it's also been stated that the reason it doesn't violate the London Convention, because the London Convention prohibits um, intentionally um, polluting the ocean, Mm-hmm. But it's been stated that they're not intentionally polluting the ocean by by dropping the um, first stage. Mm-hmm. But th- the intention is to launch a satellite into space. So it's not to create ocean pollution. The intention is to go to space. So um, I'll leave that with you guys to consider. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions about that. And I'll talk a little bit about cleaning up space debris. Oh, there is a question or a comment. Oh, that's that's Please. Uh, something you said earlier okay. about the liability convention. Oh, please, yes. Uh, so why would such a, a part of the rocket uh, falling down not be followed in the confines of that land? So, yeah. it doesn't fall into the ocean. That maybe sure. Uh, thank you. So so the question was, um, if, if there were a launch and the launch vehicle fell into, let's say, a, another state, could there be a liability convention com- claim? And the answer is absolutely yes. There, there certainly could be. Um, one interesting thing about the liability convention is it was written in such a way to make as many states liable as possible. So you could be liable if you launch the rocket or if you use your territory or facility to launch the rocket, or even if you procure the launch. So if you're just buying the launch service or if you're buying a component of a spacecraft or maybe even buying like the communication service of the spacecraft after it's launched, you could be said to have procured the launch and therefore you'd be liable for any damage caused by that space object. And the reason they did that was because there were um, all the countries on the globe in, this was again in 1972, were essentially, I mean, it was just the US and the USSR that were launching at the time. And uh, France might've been launching at the time. I'd have to check that. but very few countries were were launching states. And in order to get the buy-in of all the other countries around the world, the countries who were the third countries, the non-spacefaring nations, they wanted some guarantee that if something were dropped on them, that we'd have as many states potentially liable. Uh, And they could go after any one of the launching states. And then later on the launching states could decide between them who's ultimately gonna be liable. Product liability? You, when you buy something that it's uh, it's faulty, you can sue everybody in your life, even mm-hmm. the retail. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good comparison. Until, until the last mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. So you can sue one or everybody, and then they can uh, yeah. go to the No, it's only state, state, state them. It's not, it's not people suing people. This is countries. No, but the, the, the principle. principle. The, the principle yeah. that, the, that the consumer yeah. is... is yeah is um, compensated first and then let the states fight about it. But but as Mark's pointed out correctly, um, if an individual was hurt, he'd have to go to his government and the government would present the claim on his behalf. So I've seen one, two, three questions. So please, over here, did you have a question? Did you have a question? I got a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so does that present a sort of liability shield for private enterprise if uh, a SpaceX satellite falls into a Brazilian car and not the brain? And, uh, Brazilian wants to sue SpaceX, would they have to pull the U.S. liability? Is there some sort of mechanism for the U.S. to impose liability on SpaceX? Okay, so I'm going to try to repeat your question. So I think you said if, if SpaceX, a private entity, were to launch and it fell on a Brazilian's car, another private entity, could the private entity in Brazil sue SpaceX directly? Absolutely, they could. They could just sue them for damage, and they could probably they could sue them in Brazil, or they could sue them in the U.S., or they could sue them wherever they wanted. Or the government of Brazil could present a claim to the government of the U.S. through diplomatic channels under the Liability Convention and try to recover on behalf of its nationals. 
And then your, your final point was, does the U.S. impose liability on SpaceX? There's a very complicated um, insurance regime where SpaceX won't get its license to launch by the FAA unless they have insurance to cover um, damages that would result from the launch. So um, please. Uh, I understand the liability function requires a space object for uh, liability to be invoked. So something like the second stage, which isn't meant and is never intended to actually reach space, causes damage. Is it still is it still considered a space object? Great question. Um, it, it is, but that's because in the liability convention itself, there's a definition of space object and. Um, it's, it's one of those circular definitions, but essentially it says that a space object is defined to include its component parts. So anything that makes up the space object is the space object. So e even the vehicle that carries the space, all the components of the vehicle would be considered the space object. So even if it's not going to space itself, like the first stage. Yeah, uh, please. Um, what about uh, countries that have to get permission for rockets to pass over their territory as it's proceeding into space, to the extent that happens, do they face liability of the convention as well? And then with respect to first stage that drops back into the ocean or wherever, do property rights to that evaporate such that anyone can go and collect it and then use it to scrap or resell it or anything else? Okay, so um, tell me again your first question. <laughs> So with, in part of the, the chain of the law. Oh, right. Okay. Right. So, no, I'm with you. Okay. Um, thanks. It's just my, my memory is just this bit. Um, no. The answer is no. Um, so far, since 1957, whenever there's been a launch into space, particularly there's been, there's, I think, some state practice that's been developed here, even with the U.S. Space Shuttle. When the Space Shuttle would launch or when it would return, and this is true all over the world as well, there's never, as far as I know, there's never been a request for overflight permission for launches or for landings. Mm -hmm. And that there's state practice that if you're going to space and you overfly a state, you don't need to request permission. And states haven't insisted on it. And even like when the space shuttle would return and it would be passing through the airspace of Mexico and some other countries when it would come land in, in Florida, then um, we, we didn't request, we the US didn't request overflight permission. So that was one. And the second question you had was? Property rights. Oh, property rights. Yes. Yeah. So Article 8, which we talked about, said that the, the ownership's rights don't cease for something that's launched into space. Um, that's also true for launch or for attempted launch. But um, the launching state is responsible for the launch vehicle. So when um, a first stage splashes in the ocean on the other side of the globe, then the launching state is responsible for going and either picking that up or sometimes it'll be towed out to sea and then dumped uh, or it'll be scrapped. Uh, but particularly the US government says, no, if, if, you, if anybody finds a launch vehicle, even on the other side of the globe, if it washes up 20 years later, that property is US government mm -hmm. property. And there are folks in the State Department and it's their job um, to go out and, and get that property and, and bring it back. And there's another convention called the registration and not the registration, maybe the return of objects and the Rescue of Astronauts Convention. And um, it says that if, if something, if a spacecraft were to land in a foreign country, that there's an obligation to return it to the launching state, and the launch state has to pay compensation for those costs. Please. It, the, the, that raises an interesting, I think, and important uh, issue looking to the future, and that is the concept of abandonment. As, mm -hmm. and, and what you described so far yeah. implies that it doesn't, the concept doesn't exist the outer space treaty or the subsequent treaties. That's correct. And that, uh, let's say, Elon Musk puts up 12,000 CubeSats, mm -hmm. and this Indian entrepreneur puts up 25,000 CubeSats, mm -hmm. and then they go out of business mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, go bankrupt and close, and yep. you've got tens of thousands of CubeSats floating around up there with nobody taking responsibility for them. They're not <laughs> abandoned, and only if they're if they're abandoned, somebody could go and clean them up, but if they're not abandoned, the state that authorized the launch still owns them. That's correct. Even though no person in that state owns them. That's correct. And this is, I think, an area that could be where we see the law develop, where I imagine what we will see is bilateral agreements in the future where a state will relinquish its rights when, when another state says, I'm willing to go clean up your debris, and the first state says, okay, but if you touch it, you're responsible for it. 
Because <laughs> but now you're they, yeah. The status quo is there's no there's no end to this and there's no such thing. Correct. There's no doctrine or notion of abandonment under under space law. So uh, let's do last question for now, and then I'm going to go through the slides and leave time for questions at the end. But there's at least one more video I do want you all to see. So I want to save some time for Stephen Colbert. Okay, Going back to space debris, okay, you're the creator of things that go into space. Do you have a way in your agreements or somehow to make sure you're not liable for space debris created or anything that may happen? Is there sort of an industry agreement where liability comes to rest? I mean, um, I'm in a business, I'm in the nuclear business, our business, the new liability rests with the operator of the nuclear facility. How does it, and you talked about here the ownership of the state, but I mean, it must be for the building. Private parties, how do they sort this out amongst themselves? Sure, and I, for the most part, I mean, you can you can contract for anything. You can you can uh, you can uh, disclaim this this liability. However, because there are certain safeguards set up through the regulatory process um, through satellites that are getting licenses from from the FCC, for for example. Um, once you you see that they have a license from the FCC, you know that they've had to comply with certain requirements in regard to uh, planning for end of life of their of their satellites, and so there's so they have already taken on that responsibility through the licensing through the licensing process. Um, so far, uh, that's how I've seen it. You feel, you feel comfortable. If they got a license, they must have taken care of it. Well, that they have, uh, <laughs> that, that, they are, that they have satisfied the FCC's requirements or NOAA's requirements, depending. Well, some, some countries are waking up to the fact that, oh, yeah, we signed this treaty mm -hmm. back a while ago. Mm -hmm. We were responsible for We're actually this. responsible for this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, something. <laughs> Well, right. and as the and as the new space industry is growing, and you are seeing satellite companies that are are popping up, this is not a, a U.S. folk or U.S. only industry. There are companies across the globe, and there are licensing regimes across the world. And and as you said, countries are waking up to the fact that they are going to be held that they could be held responsible for the acts of their nationals. So it's something that's coming to bear. So in order to save a little bit of time for, for questions okay. at the end, uh, I'll just fly through these slides. How do we clean up space junk? There, like I said, it's essentially two questions. One is, how do you stop making new space junk? And then how do you clean up the junk that's already there? Um, one way to stop making new space junk is has to do with ASAP testing. And um, as was mentioned before, there are both good and bad examples that we could look at in terms of ASAP testing. Is if you're going to test an ASAP, how to do it safely. Um, there are ways you could do it in a low orbit. You could, instead of hitting it from the ground going up, you could hit it from the top going down. You could push the debris down when it's created. But there are ways that you can do it that are more thoughtful of the environment than the way it might have been done in 2007. Um, anybody who's ever a Cub Scout knows if you go camping, you always pack out when you pack in. <laughs> um, how do you clean up the space junk that's already there? There are a couple of different theories about that, and there are a couple of businesses that are starting to come along with different ideas on how to do that. Um, one possible idea is what has been called the laser broom, and NASA um, has been doing some studies about this where when debris, particularly small pieces of debris, when it passes overhead, if it were to be hit with a laser, it could be heated up and it could be, the word is ablated, meaning you could chip off little pieces of it. It would heat it up, it would lower the orbit. When it would lower the orbit, it would come back down into the atmosphere, it would burn up, and then you could take care of small pieces of debris with that. Uh, one potential issue, of course, is you'd have to make sure that the airspace is safe, right? Because you wouldn't want to be flying through that, that laser beam. That's right. Yeah, you have to see what's what's below the debris that you're uh, ablating. You know, the main problem with what you said legal is that you can spend an awful lot of money doing that and make no impact 
Right, or create more debris. Or you could just use a digital weapon. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> so where you stand depends on where you sit. Yeah. Um, so another idea is something more like a broom, um, or imagine like a big piece of bubble gum that somebody blows, where you go through lower Earth orbit and you collect all the little small pieces of debris. Um, that's fine until the device breaks, and then you've got this massive debris creating event. <laughs> Because you've collected all this debris and then it's all centralized. And then if that were hit by a piece of debris, it would be a real disaster. And a lot of folks say, well, why don't you just get a giant magnet? And you could just go through space and you could pick up all the debris. And that works until you find out that spacecraft often don't have any iron in them. And therefore, if there's no iron, then a, a magnet doesn't work. How big would that net have to be? The size of Texas or something, right? I mean, that big. Mm -hmm. A net the size of the drone would have no effect. Or would have to be up there a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a couple other ideas. Uh, essentially, like moving the debris out of the way. So one option is you can go get it and you can bring it back to Earth. And there's a company uh, in Japan called Astroscale that's uh, planning on doing that now, where they would go up there, they would get a little motor, they'd attach it to the debris, and then they'd bring it down. Um, and they're looking to make that commercial. Of course, one question, of course, is who's going to pay for it? So right now, you know, there's no cost to polluting the well, common if, areas. If your space debris could potentially come down and hit people on the ground, and then your country or your international environmental organization could be absolutely mm -hmm. liable. Mm -hmm. So you might consider, I can think of a satellite that fits that bill, mm -hmm. you might consider paying for that. Launch one, launched by Europe, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Another option is to, to take the spacecraft and, and launch it so far, I mean, to just to move it so far away that it, it couldn't harm anybody. And this is the notion of graveyard orbits, that if you take something and move it beyond geostationary orbit to a graveyard orbit, then, um, then it, we don't use that orbit yet. We don't know how to use that orbit. Um, it's not useful to us, so we could just put all the dead satellites there so the orbits that we do use would be clean. But I'm sorry. That's where they're. That's where they're going. That's where defined by the IEDC. Mm -hmm. The 300 mm -hmm. kilometers above. Yeah, yeah that's above, right. Above Geo. But that raises also the question of whether or not people actually are going to explore beyond Earth. Mm -hmm. You have to get through that debris field mm -hmm. to go to Mars or to you know. Yeah. There, there's a really good video in that regard of um, what was that movie about the little robot who cleans up the Earth. Wally. Wally, right. When Wally's <laughs> launching up from the earth and he has to pierce through that, that, that cloud of debris. So a couple um, conclusions that I'm going to show you a little video. Uh, and that is we, we need to reduce the proliferation of orbital debris. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be without cost. But we do know that even if we do nothing else, the amount of debris is going to continue to increase. So it seems to call for some action. And before and, we uh, ahead, before we we hit the Colbert video, which I love, is great. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, reduce, but as a kid in school, I remember a couple other R's, sure. um, such as reuse and and recycle, uh -huh. and that is another aspect of of this discussion is reusing assets that are already in space, so that we're not creating more debris, finding. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, finding another life for those. Right. So some of those, uh, so some of those fuel tanks that have been sitting in orbit for years, possibly repur repurposing them for for space stations. Uh, I can imagine who would possibly be doing that. Um, and that was a little bit of a plug for for nano racks there. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean you, 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 what you say is, is actually a, a functional program that NASA is working on and DARPA was working on with a project Phoenix where there could be a perfectly good satellite out there that maybe it just doesn't have any fuel, mm -hmm. but all the other parts work. And if you could find a way to refuel it, like the robotic refueling mission, mm -hmm. then you could get another 30 years. Or maybe the satellite is defunct, but the, I don't know, maybe the solar arrays work fine or the batteries work fine, you might be able to mm -hmm. salvage it and put them together. And, and there are entities that are out there that are working on that. So um, again, just now this is um, something that'll be a little bit entertaining and I think you'll find it um, uh, amusing. But there was a NASA satellite uh, some years ago that was um, there a very high risk of, of hitting the earth. And it came to the attention of Stephen Colbert. And uh, there's a little four or five minute video that I think you guys will enjoy.
And then after this, we'll take any questions. Can you raise the volume? Can I raise the volume? I can remote it. So. Thank you. Let's just pray it lands somewhere it can't do any damage, like Detroit. <laughs> this death machine, this death machine in question is NASA's 20-year-old Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite, or URs, as in you are all going to die. <laughs> now, folks, it's true. Folks, while you're running for your lives, I don't want you to panic. Because the boys at NASA have pinpointed the precise time the impact will occur. Jim? Experts at Vandenberg Air Force Base at NASA say the satellite will re-enter the atmosphere sometime tomorrow afternoon, give or take about 14 hours. Yes. <laughs> tomorrow afternoon, give or take 14 hours. Which means you either have until Saturday morning or you were vaporized two hours ago. <laughs> and NASA has pinpointed exactly where the satellite will fall. Jim? Engineers now expect it will break into 100 pieces on re-entry. A quarter of those could make it to Earth. NASA is pretty sure that any surviving pieces of the satellite will fall somewhere between 57 degrees north and 57 degrees south. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> the evacuation zone. The evacuation zone is this area. <laughs> if you're one of the six billion thrill seekers in the impact zone, you will want to flee to the safety of either Antarctica or the Norwegian island of Svalbard. <laughs> no, don't worry, because you have plenty of time to get there. Because in addition to providing a 28-hour impact window across a 118 million square mile danger zone, NASA is providing a 20-minute warning. <laughs> More than enough time to make it to Antarctica, provided that you are an emperor penguin. Now, if for some reason you are unwilling or unable to evacuate the habitable zones of the Earth, and the satellite crashes near you, NASA warns, do not touch it. <laughs> Which, of course, means you're going to want to touch it. <laughs> just, just think about it, folks. It's been bombarded with space rays for 20 years. Obviously, it will give you superpowers. You <laughs> could become the human satellite. <laughs> channels of crystal clear high def he can paralyze evildoers with too many viewing options <laughs> up in the sky it's a bird it's a plane it's the human satellite burning up on re-entry <sighs> but folks you probably won't have the chance to touch yours because nasa has reassured us that the odds of it hitting any specific person are one in 21 trillion with a margin of error a plus or minus 21 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway, why don't we just stop there? and um, see if you guys have any questions. We've got about four minutes left, <laughs> and uh, Jessica and I are happy to discuss this about yeah, uh, nice outer space law, space debris, space junk, anything like that. There's a question here in the back. It's 2030. Uh, the Space Corps has long since been established. They've set up two military uh, stations uh, in low Earth orbit. Several other countries have set up military stations in low Earth orbit. Elon Musk's is now 20,000 low Earth orbit satellites, and the Indian has the Indian entrepreneur has 25,000 low Earth orbit satellites. You're the general counsel of the Space Corps, and the general decides, listen, we got to clean this up. It's getting in the way. We're going to do a mopping up operation, and we're going to declare these hostile 
uh, abandoned. We're just going to declare your job as general counsel is figure out how to justify cleaning up what we're doing with mop up operation because it's jeopardizing our military installation. What's the what's the justification for cleaning up tens of thousands of CubeSats mm -hmm. uh, by a military mm -hmm. organization because it's interfering with and they will find just we know that. I'm just wondering what it is. So, so, so in your hypothetical, you're talking about Space Corps or Space Force? Like Space Corps is I mean, a civilian. The, the Donald Trump uh, U.S. Space Force. Space Force, two, right? Military Space Force. Yeah. Okay. As two military right. installations in orbit, right. and they're not going to tolerate all these foreign cubesats flying around. So, I, th there, there are some issues with your hypothetical that you that you that you laid out. But um, I, th I think what you're asking is, is it acceptable to clean a commons? Could a nation decide that they wanted to clean the ocean or, or clean exactly. that? That's really or clean, clean space. And, um, and, and with a particular focus on a military, which would do it and then figure out the legal justification. You know, that, that I, I needed to get a law school final exam question for my students. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think we just, when, when the question itself exceeds the amount of time we have left to answer the question, let's let's talk about it afterwards, but it's great, and it's a great subject for discussion. Does anybody have any questions we can address in the time we have left? Please, question in the back. Uh, yeah, so I'm curious what uh, impact you think uh, neural networks that do uh, debris tracking is going to have on the liability landscape. Uh, like you pointed out, one of the major issues with Enforcing liability now is that often origin is hard to determine for smaller pieces of debris. Mm -hmm. But now that there is this, um, in, there's an installation on the ISS that tracks um, microscopic pieces of debris, and I know that there are companies that are using neural networks to track debris in clouds mm -hmm. and uh, you know predict paths of groups of debris based on like the origin of like a collision. Mm -hmm. Do you think that making it easier to determine the origins of these smaller pieces of debris is going to change the way that nations feel about? Um, risking collision and risking putting debris up there, knowing that it would be easier to de determine liability? I, I don't think it would. I, I think that no one's going to change their behavior because now there's greater evidence or greater proof that you can track the source of the debris. Countries will still launch. Countries mm -hmm. will still take risks. If anything, it might reduce insurance costs, I think, because now you can find out who generated the debris and who's ultimately liable because it's, it's space insurance, particularly for unknown collision events, that I think makes space launch business so expensive, apart from getting to space. So the fact that now that identification of the source of the debris is clearer, I think, if anything, it should bring liability risks down. Would Please. We be, oh, would sorry. we be eligible? Mark. Would we be liable for debris? I mean, people have been making debris for 60 years, so it seems to be customary and allowed to make debris. So why suddenly? change it especially and, and, and a bit follow on to that is who's going to believe whose opinion it is right who owns that debris? right so there are the two issues you raised so so one we, we talked about in the very top of the hour where we said it's not against the law to create debris and there is state practice in creating debris and as we know only harmful contamination is prohibited so some contamination is expected i mean it's it's the cost of exploring spaces you're going to have like on on the moon i mean there are installations that the U.S. left on the moon that are still there, that just it's the cost of, of, of exploring. But your, your second point, I think, is also very interesting, is the veracity of the data. So, you know, we could have the best data in the world, whether it's supplied by DOD or civilian agency. And if somebody says, well, we don't believe it because it's supplied by the Americans, that's got nothing to do with the accuracy of the data anymore. So yeah, it's another issue. Let's make this the last question and then we'll break because I know Wes is going to get mad at me if I'm between you and cocktails. <laughs> during, during the proposal, was it possible to say require the states do something to do, you know, put into their space objects the ability to be able to identify where it came from? In other words, you know, some sort yeah. of signature that's required yeah. as a matter of practice. You have to have that sort of the same way you can sort of look at a Right. So, so there's no requirement now, but there have been proposals that are out there for essentially like RFID or something, or even like a little beeper or something that can be put onto um, CubeSat so it can be identified, so it can be tracked. What happens is once it would 
break up in orbit. I mean, that beeper would go one direction and all the other the rest would go, would go another. Yeah. Yeah. another direction. But there, there are proposals to make objects more easily identifiable, more readily identifiable so that they can be tracked, particularly the, the smallest ones. But it doesn't get to the flex of paint issue or the, the, the frozen no, fuel that might get there. Yeah. That's an American formulation. Mark, that. would you address? Yeah. It's products, these are products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People are buying Martin Black and they could be in France or they're buying a Boeing satellite. They mm -hmm. could be anywhere or, or yeah. so which one is it? And that's right. The problem. Now when the object comes back, it's identifiable by the paint or by the metal or by the chemical composition. But all you'd be able to do is find out who produced it, but not necessarily who bought it, who launched it, who'd be responsible. So um, Jessica, do you want to make any closing remarks and then I'll just take a minute? Yeah, I think that you know, being from the, the private industry, we do have uh, an interest in making sure that we have a space environment where we can continue to operate. Um, and, <laughs> oh my goodness, you did bring enough for the class. I, I didn't, I, 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 <laughs> we wanna make sure that we have an environment where we can still operate, we can still use it for, for peaceful purposes and for commercial purposes. Um, and so it is why I am I am hopeful when I see the different uh, the different um, goodness, my words just left me the um, the different things that are uh, that are being suggested as far as reusing uh, assets in space when when I look at efforts by countries such as right now the FCC's orbital debris mitigation. Con countries are starting to take this idea more seriously and they're looking for ways to start cleaning it up. So um, it's just how we do that within mm -hmm. the international legal framework mm -hmm. is going to be an interesting question, especially with the long-term sustainability uh, working groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I just want to say as well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come and, and, and give this talk and get so many people who are interested in the space debris issue. And some of the topics we talked about tonight, like intergenerational equity and international environmental law and polluter pays principle and, you know, the issues beyond national jurisdiction. I mean, these are fundamental. They're environmental issues, but they're also moral issues. And we can talk about what's legal and what's illegal, we could also talk about what's right and what's wrong and what's legal and what's right aren't necessarily synonymous. If you didn't answer a question or if you didn't have a chance to answer a question, I do have some extra mission patches up here as well as some extra um, space junk, I mean, little NASA pins and things. Um, and let me just turn the floor over to Sean to say a quick goodnight to everybody and yeah, invite us to the reception. That was a fascinating discussion and uh, just join me in thanking uh, Steve and Jessica.